taken a little bit by surprise that I'm supposed to moderate it. I'm not. Actually, I'm just one of the three participants. So we'll keep it very simple. We are all practic practicing poets. We can go on and on about uh, non-poetic things outside poetry, but I think it's best to focus on the poems itself, and then perhaps at the end we'll have a chat and talk and so on and so forth. Um, it's 10.40 now, so let's give e all of each of us, say, maybe 10 to 11 minutes um, straight reading for half an hour or so, and then we'll open it up. So let's start this way. Uh, good morning. You know that I'm from the Fidel Castro land, and we love this, you know, the podiums. Okay, and I want to invite my translator. I write in Spanish, and I will read my poems in Spanish, but uh, Catherine Hedin is my translator into English, and I want to invite her to be with me here, okay? Uh, the first poem is a long poem, but I was just to read an stanza of that poem. It's a, it's a, it was a long conversation with the night, but the night never responded to me. El aire se desploma, a sí mismo se dicta. Hasta la hormiga sabe que rima con fatiga. En la espalda del fuego, ¿quién escribe? El azar es mi acierto, como el pato de cabeza en el agua. La sed es la corriente, el hambre la adherencia. El pato indaga en la dura fluidez y su plumaje umbrío hace brillar todo el ser congelado. La forma es ideológica. Con la contemplación, el mundo cambia. The air collapses into itself, pronounces itself. Even the ant knows it rhymes with scant. On fire's back, who's writing? Fate is my good move like the duck head first in the water. Thirst is current, hunger stickiness. The duck searches in the hard fluidity and its shady plumage makes all the frozen being glow. Form is ideological. With contemplation, the world transforms. This is another long poem, and I will read uh, three stanzas. Cuando cae la sombra, todo se vuelve Cuba. Una ausencia de luz que no me deja ciego. No soy hermano de todo el que juegue dominó en las esquinas. No soy hermano de todo el que rabie por una tacita de café recién colado. No soy hermano de todo el que sepa dar vueltas de casino. La noche no se pone camisetas del Che, ni toca las maracas en un bar solo para turistas. La noche no lleva pelucas de Celia Cruz, ni fuma tabacos de contrabando, ni sabe a Bacardí. La sombra no me pide pasaporte, carné de identidad. No requiere visado, permiso de salida. Solo la noche es libre en Miami, en La Habana. La noche sin frontera, sin irse ni quedarse. La noche sin censura ni libertad de prensa. La noche democrática que quita el sueño al cuadro, al disidente. Solo la noche en sí utópica y abierta en cualquier parte. Sombra reverde que no da su brazo a torcer, aunque escarbe con el lápiz más fino. Noche insubordinada hasta contra sí misma, y aunque las tenga todas que perder, no cree en claridades. Sombra contestataria que testifica con sus insectos y estrellas 
y demanda el silencio. Nadie ha podido doblegar la sombra, ponerla de rodillas ante una sola luz. No habrá revolución si no dejamos que la noche hable. When shadow falls, everything turns to Cuba. An absence of light that won't leave me blind. I'm no brother to those who play dominoes on the corner. I'm no brother to those who die for a little cup of fresh brewed coffee. I'm no brother to those who know how to dance casino. Night doesn't wear Che t-shirts or play the maracas in some tourist trap. Night doesn't wear Celia Cruz wigs or smoke smuggled cigars or taste like Bacardi. Shadow doesn't ask for my passport, identification card, doesn't require a visa for entry or exit. Only night is free in Miami, in Havana. Night with no borders, no leaving, no staying. Night with no censorship or freedom of the press. Night democratic keeps the cadre up, keeps the dissident up. Only night herself, utopian, open, anywhere. Shadow rebellious won't let her arm be twisted though she unearths with the finest pencil. Night insubordinate even against herself. Though she's got everything to lose, she won't believe in clarities. Shadow nonconformist testifying with her insects and stars and demanding silence. Nobody's been able to break shadow. Bring her to her knees before just one light. There won't be revolution if we don't let night speak. I'll read a few poems from a volume called Glengower. That's a fictional town in Ireland. With a doleful subtitle, Poems for No One in Irish and English. <coughs> so for those of you who may not have heard the Irish language spoken before, it's the language uh, which has the oldest literary and poetic tradition in Europe after Latin and Greek. Bratachabona Ta Bratach Vedica Eringalach Umpabon Tuarha Eginian Ni frakinishia na real tree na strioka bring load. Lob the green begach bratrake. White flags. The American flag on the moon has turned white bleached by the sun. The stars and stripes are nothing now, a dream. All flags will pale some sunny day. <laughs> Is the gentleman from the CIA in the audience? Please arrange for my flight to Guantanamo Bay <laughs> as quickly as possible. My publisher says we need all the publicity we can get. <laughs> um, 
one of the Indian writers mentioned last night is the late, great uh, A.K. Ramanujan. And when I read his uh, anthology, Speaking of Shiva, as a very young man, I knew that uh, my poetic work and my poetic imagination would always, from that moment on, be uh, touched and influenced and colored by Indian civilization in one way or another. <laughs> Thank you. This poem is called The Poet as Untouchable. The poet is the Dalit, the untouchable of our times. He has cast a shadow on all, like some cloud that appears from nowhere, from some hill or mountain where language still mutters like rain, where a goddess dwells in a cave, unsung epics smoldering in her breast, untouchable poet, we cannot bear the silent thunder of his name. One of the themes from last night's inaugural speeches was uh, the Me Too movement, and uh, I thought of a poem I had written about the sex workers, Korean sex workers in the Imperial Japanese Army. So this poem is called Comfort Lady, A Veteran Remembers. It was plain she had lost her reason, as I had lost my soul. One morning the sun reddened over a roaring maze of trees. How to know blood from dew? I tore up all my haiku. For years afterwards my mouth sagged. My wife said, you've had a stroke. No, my eyes screamed, their whites curdled. Old pleasures yield nothing. Calligraphy, the brush is not warm in my hand. Gardening, more death than life in the soil. The pageantry of seasons, crumbling stage scenery. After the war, she leaped to her death, emitting an eagle's whistling cry. Fade out. It's on film. I saw it on a history channel, roughly six seconds. Was it you? I write this down so that my children and grandchildren and their children will know of my sorrow. A leaf has just landed on the veranda. I pick it up, finger its veins and half choke. Time passes, a running sore. I went to die for the emperor and lived. I am eaten by shame. Comfort lady, what was your name? <laughs> Thank you, Gabriel. Perhaps. Thank can, you. Yeah. Okay, that's it. So I'll utilize my 11 and a half minutes in the following way. I will read two poems live, and then I will screen two very, very short films, which are made on my poetry by various artists. Uh, good morning, and it's lovely to share the stage with two very, very fine poets. I also see some really good poets in the audience. 
Indian poets and otherwise. Uh, there's Mars, there's Brian, there's several people in this festival. I think the poetry component in this festival is very, very strong. So do check out the other people's work. This is a poem I've read before, but I'm reading it because I'm just coming from a very, very moving uh, session on Kashmir. Uh, I had to leave five minutes before because I was supposed to be part of this, but it's simply called Kargil. I don't have to explain anything. Uh, the only thing I need to tell you is I visited Kargil 10 years after the flashpoint, the war itself. And it opens with uh, a poet who has been a big influence in my life, one of my mentors. It's um, Derek Walcott. And I uh, quote from his wonderfully fabulous book-length poem called Teopola's Hound. And I quote, a street of smoke and fences, gutters gorged with weed and reeking, scorching iron grooves of rusted galvanize, a dialect forged from burning asphalt, and a sky that moves with thunderhead cumuli, grumbling with rain. Ten years on, I came searching for war signs of the past, expecting remnants, magazine debris, unexploded shells, shrapnels that mark bomb wounds. I came looking for ghosts, people past, skeletons charred, abandoned brick wood cement that once housed them. I could only find whispers, whispers among the clamor of a small town outpost in full throttle, everyday chores catching outward signs of normalcy and life. In that bustle, I spot war lines of a decade ago, though the storylines are kept buried, wrapped in old newsprint. There's order amid uneasiness, the Milsons cry, the monks chant, baritones merging in their separateness. At the bus station, black coughs of exhaust smokescreen everything. The roads meet, and after the crossroad ritual, diverge, skating along the undotted lines of control. A porous garland with cracked beads adorns Tiger Hill. Beyond the mountains are dark memories, and beyond them, no one knows. And beyond them, no one wants to know. Even the flight of birds that wing over their crests don't know which feathers to down. Chameleon-like, they fly, tracing perfect parabolas. I look up and calculate their exact arc and find instead a flawed theorem. This is a, a fairly new poem. Um, we are talking about the politics of division, lack of dissent that people are getting put behind bars. In, in general, I think we are really living, living in a very, very rotten space. People have no self-belief. People spread fake news. We have wonderful writers and world leaders who are just up to complete destruction and nonsense. And one of the things that is not pressed forward enough is that the real war is about our climate. It's about lack of water. It's about impure air. We can have all the fabulous uh, spaces in the world, but if we can't even protect our environment, what are we doing? I live in Delhi. I have to wear a mask. So this is an elegy for Delhi. And it's called Disembodied. My body carved from abandoned bricks of a ruined temple, from minaret shards of an old mosque, 
from slate remnants of a medieval church apse, from soil tilled by my ancestors. My bones don't fit together correctly as they should. The searing ultraviolet light of aurora borealis patches and etch corrects my orientation as magnetic pulses prove potent. My flesh sculpted from fruits of the tropics, blood from coconut water, skin colored by brown bark of Indian teak, my lungs fueled by Delhi's deep toxic air, echo asthmatic sounds, a new vinyl dub remix. A universe where radiation germinates from human follies, where contamination persists from mistrust, where pleasures of sex are merely a sport, where everything is ambition, everything is desire, everything is nothing, nothing and everything. White light everywhere, but no one can recognize its hue. All possible colors. Body worshipped not for its blessing, but its contour. Artificial shape, shaped by Nautilus. Skin moistened by L'Oreal and not by the season's first rains. Skeleton strength not shaped by the earthquakes or slow molded by fearless forest fires. Ice caps are rapidly melting, too fast to arrest glacial slide. In the near future, there will be no water left, or too much water that is undrinkable, excess water that will drown us all. Disembodied floats afloat like Noah's Ark. No GPS, no pole star navigation, no fossil fuel to burn away, just maps with empty grids and names of places that might exist. Already, there is too much traffic on the road. Unpeopled hollow metal shells without brakes swerve about directionless looking for an elusive compass. And you'll see two short films which contain some of my poems. The first one is called Silence. Uh, it's been made by a, 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 a Ramanjit Kaur, a woman filmmaker living in Kolkata. Uh, who I didn't know until she asked me that she wants to make these films. Um, I was reading a few years ago at the Kolkata Literature Festival, and after the reading, she just came up. Just give me a second. After the reading, she came up and she bought my books, and then two years later, I see this. It's just extraordinary what beautiful artists can do with other people's work. The second film is a collaboration with uh, one of the finest doins of Indian dance, uh, Padmashri Shovna Narayan, the Kathak dancer. And the poem you'll see, Prayer Flag, is basically a prologue to her production, Shunyata, which is essentially a very Buddhist text. And my next book, in fact, follows from there. I have been obsessed with classical Indian dance for the last 35 years. So the next book is called The Whispering Anklet, Payal. And that's just one. So I'll leave you to that, and then we'll have a chat. Can we have the lights off, please? After a long concert and after dinner, I find myself unexpectedly with you in my room. In this new space, finding oneself is wonderful. 
I was here and not here at the same time. Later I felt as if I had entered a story of an old familiar novel, a character I knew but had not met in flesh until now. Winter's Dream Our mattress is the wide ocean, the crushed sheets, the waves. We sail together full-blown. But during your long absences as our ships are docked on different shores, sometimes the bed dreams. I imagine the wet breaking the anchor loose, defying gravity, current and electricity as photons propel and burn, even the wild salted expands into a monument, a desire, permanent like the ocean bed, its pulses uncontrollably rocking. The waters, the bodies, the dreams. Silence has its own subtle color. Between each breath pause, heat simmers latent saliva, tongue entwined lisp. Here and there, errant clouds wait, yearning for rain, desire melting even silence to words. Words color bleed incarnadine as your lips whisper softly the secrets of your silence. Your fine chicken blouse, white, sheer, and almost transparent, cannot hide the quiet of your heartbeat on your wheat olive skin. The milk white flower adorning your hair sheds a solitary petal just one in that petal silence blooms color white transparent white pure white silence Morning. 
jewel in the lotus. One, Manas Sarovar, Mount Kailash. Frayed, flapping in the high winds, prayer flags gently unravel. Homage to the day's first light. But today the dawn is not as bright, though heavy, brooding, silver grey like the lake's shimmering glass top. No one is here except for a woman staring far away, wrapped in her sanctity of continuous linen, her own sari like a prayer flag, though devoid of any colour. She isn't mourning or crying, just gazing fixedly into the water's changing glimmer as the sky's wet weight and the shore's rocky line meet, their edges meanderingly melting into the lake itself. I stood far behind her, behind everything she saw. She was only an accidental figure in the widescreen frame. Unlike her, I was looking skywards through the prayer flag's translucent cotton, counting each thread of each piece of cloth that wove private stories whispered only to me. Weather-worn, strung across canted multiple horizons, I tried to map their own geographies, each an island, each with its own terrain, texture, inscription and scripture. Found on the highest points on land, as close to the sky as is possible, these magic carpets, shapes caught on an unintentional clothesline, were more meaningful to me than this vast monastic scenery. How each flag, each one must have preserved secrets that only their owners knew. How each a talisman exuded safety and calm, shrouding away grief for the briefest while when one forgets everything, real, imagined, and just dreams. My own piece of cloth that I once tied onto this line wasn't visible to me now. But that did not matter. I found strength in this procession of private passion, in these flags' lack of starch or hierarchy. Their story is passed down by one flag to another, toggled hand in hand through time and age. Just like my pet yellow butterfly who infused each flower in my garden with the gift of life without any show or fair. I like the transparent quiet here. I also like the wind's occasional sound, its severe current tearing through the flag's heart, picking out the perfect pitch and melody. A memory now, a still, framed, not revealing to the world what I had once seen. The panorama's generosity, its wild, stark untouchability, how each story stitched and preserved like the jewel in the lotus, its crystal fine edges caressed by petal soft skin, until everything falls inward, like a fetus in a womb, a toppled, misplaced comma, my own implanted memory. And then they bloom, fanning outward, each flag, strand, story, each private grief and pleasure, chanting noiselessly in the mountain's silent winds.
task. But we have 11 minutes, and uh, because we started 11 min and a quarter minute late, so we have 11 minutes for discussion. Uh, uh, we have no, but we started late. Oh, well, time out is, yes. So, uh, Victor, can I ask you uh, your collaboration with uh, Catherine, um, the sort of translation processes that you uh, engage in? Well, we, we translate uh, poetry from Spanish into English and from English into Spanish. We chose to translate uh, Latin American poets uh, from the second half of the 20th century because that's a part of uh, Latin American poetry that has been neglected and was not possible to find in English uh, those poets. And at the same time, we translate uh, poetry from English into Spanish, and we want to basically translate poets that uh, write in English that belong to the periphery of the um, uh, poetry in English. We have published a very successful anthology of Native American poets, <laughs> contemporary Native American poet, 14, they are all alive. Um, we translated another anthology of Welsh poets, Welsh poetry, and that's half, uh, between them, uh, they are almost 10 edition of those books, and we will keep working. Okay, Gabriel, you have uh, a sort of, we all share a similar sort of obsession and um, uh, motivation by by uh, 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 a situation that we were born into, which is at least a forked tongue. We are at least bilingual, if not long more. Tell us about how you uh, interface Irish language and English language, because you work very beautifully in both of them, and now what the tensions are when you are interfacing two languages. And, but you're trying to convey the same story. Hello? <coughs> time out. The rest is silence. I'm a good timekeeper. If we start late, we finish late. <laughs> English is simply a matter of uh, convenience for me. It is uh, not a language I would take seriously as a genuine uh, reflection of the ancient poetic spirit uh, of Ireland. It's an imposed language and we use it when we have to. So we have, we have three minutes for questions from the audience. Anybody has any questions, queries, observations? Uh, hi, thank you for the wonderful recitals. Uh, quick question for Gabriel. Um, with the, uh, uh, I would just like to hear your thoughts about the status and the uh, future for uh, the Giltak regions and uh, Irish as a language. Um, where where do you think that's headed, and what kind of a readership uh, do you have currently? Do you think within Ireland and outside? I don't know. I think the only hope we have is that the environmental activists uh, join forces with uh, the linguistic activists and see the link. In other words, as the, uh, the threat to natural biodiversity increases, if we can see the link to the uh, endangerment of linguistic and cultural diversity. If we make that link, there is a possibility that languages 
many of which are dying at the rate of a one, per, one a fortnight in the past few decades, there is some hope that we can stem uh, that uh, incredible loss to human civilization. Otherwise, if something like that doesn't happen, I feel that uh, hundreds of languages will be extinct by the end of this century, and I think my language, Irish, will only be something for a few academics and a few poets to toy with. Um, it will be gone. Anybody else? So thank you so, so much. Thank you.